Hello, everyone. I'm Dia Summers. Before I read scripture, I'll just let everyone know, Ryan and I do lead a community group. Um, and the focus of our group this year is raising passionate Jesus followers. So you don't have to be a parent, but if you're interested in that topic of um, how to shepherd youth in the city of Portland to uh, get to know, love, follow Jesus, then we could be a good spot for you. Um, currently, we have six adults and five kids, so probably a, a little more room, but we're trying to find and keep the balance to make it doable so that we can um, actually achieve that goal. Um, but part of the focus of our group is that actually some of the weeks, and we haven't totally figured out what it's going to look like, but um, we're going to be like meeting all together, kids and the adults to do, um, like, going over a Bible project video together um, and, and, like, being intentional about sharing our faith with our kids. So, um, so plug for that. And then I'm on the prayer team also, and I was funny. He asked me to do this, and I was like, I'm going to take the opportunity to have a minute of silent prayer. And then he did it. <laughs> I was like, oh, praise Jesus. So that's awesome. Um, okay, now, this has a lot of names in it. So y'all are going to need to forgive me (laughs) for stumbling over it. Would you stand with me in reverence for the reading of the Holy Scriptures from Jeremiah 29, 1 through 14? These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests and prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and, his, and the mother, queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and, and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by hand, by the hand of Elasa, the son of Saphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom... Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil. To to give you a future and a hope. When you will call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Well, we have been in a, this is week four of a little vision series to kind of gather us together and kind of set, set an agenda for the ministry year. And we've been um, talking about just a desire that seems to have been collectively on the heart of this community, at least uh, specifically the people that lead and serve here, um, for, for just greater depth 
and that, that depth, that desire for depth was expressed in terms of just the sense that there, there's deep, there are deeper places to go, of course, uh, with our God, um, deeper places to go in discipleship and abiding in Him, uh, but also in community, just a greater lear- just yearning and longing for connection, for serving one another, for knowing, like, what are the real needs and to meet those needs. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of those ideas that were communicated that were just kind of on the heart of this church, it turned out they, were, they could be very easily categorized and summarized and discussed from the vantage point of the four pillars of Door of Hope, which were kind of four kind of vision, uh, value, ideas that the church was founded on um, and that, are, that still lead and guide us today. Um, and so we've been working through those. We've, we've, we began with the cross. Uh, which defines our theology. We went to community, which defines our life together. Last week, we talked about simplicity, which defines much of our philosophy. And today, we talk about the fourth and final pillar, which is the city, the city, the place in which we live, the place in which we minister. And uh, if, if the simplicity pillar I mentioned last week has always historically been the most difficult to discuss uh, pragmatically, the city pillar has always been the most divisive. And some of that's been self-inflicted. And this is the weirdest thing, y'all. I have no idea how or why this happened, but I found this on the floor yesterday upstairs in the balcony, and no one knows what this is probably. Some of you might. This is a little card. It has the Door of Hope logo, and it says, write your zip code. (laughs) Everybody remember that? A few of you. So uh, Josh White, who's the founding pastor of Door of Hope, he's the lead pastor at Door of Hope Southeast, our sister church. He, he has always fought to keep Door of Hope a tenaciously city-oriented church, and I think it's been a really good thing. But sometimes the ways in which he, express, he expresses that passion and that love for the city have been in ways that uh, perhaps could have been interpreted as a little bit off-putting to some. Uh, and I remember this. It was in this building years ago. Uh, they handed out these little cards and said, okay, I want you to fill this out. And it was, there was just this push, like, hey, we need to, like, at, at the time, Door of Hope was just like, there were so many services happening and there were so few seats in the building and it was so difficult to get everybody in. And it was kind of like, hey, if you don't live in the city, like Portland city limits, we may be gently ask, maybe not so gently, asking you <laughs> to maybe find a church closer to where you live. And I remember like this was part of the assessment of figuring out like how many people are you know, proximate to the church. It is the strangest thing. I did not, pr- I swear to you, I did not print this off. I was like walking around here last week and just on the floor in the balcony, I was like, what the heck? <laughs> this is the card. It must have fallen out of one of your Bibles or something. Or someone was just knew this pillar talk was coming up and you're like, <laughs> I dare you, do it again, do it again. That is really bizarre. Did someone do that, like, intentionally? (laughs) Okay. I'll take that as a maybe. (laughs) Well, okay, we're not going to be doing that. Um, But I do want to define the city pillar. And there's, there's three practical ideas before we get into the scripture that I just want to lay out. What, what, what function the city pillar has had for us as a church and now church is here in Portland. The, The first idea is that the city pillar the idea of the city forms a, a relational center of gravity for us. Um, it's the context and it's the enabler of our locality. And it's even what makes the community pillar make sense. And we mentioned, I think we've mentioned a couple of times in this series now, there it has been a push um, over the last decade as technology's enabled it for, for churches to begin to adopt almost this idea that like their local church is supposed to be the church for like everybody everywhere. And that's become, you know, kind of, it's overlapping with this idea of like online church and there's churches like, we are an online campus and you tune into us everywhere. And the main way you interact with our church is through our app. And yes, we get people in community through, you know, discussion groups online and stuff. Um, And I would just contend that while they may very well be a good, you know, sort of Christian content delivery service, which is good, that's a good thing. It's not a church by any biblical definition of that. A church requires locality. Every genuine local church must be located somewhere for the people to actually be in relationship with one another, which seems to be like a huge part of the heartbeat of the church in the New Testament. So we aren't a church that is striving to be for everyone everywhere, nor can any church genuinely be. 
If it is true that every church must be somewhere if it's going to be a community, well, it turns out, hey, we are somewhere. We're in Portland. We're here in Northeast Portland, actually, right here on 9th and Fremont. And so Portland uh, becomes our center of gravity, and it becomes the thing that enables us to actually say, like, hey, the people that will call this church home have to be proximate to Portland. And we're not, I want to say very clearly, we're not saying if you don't live in Portland city limits, certainly if you don't live in Northeast Portland, you're not welcome here. Of course. What we are saying is that by holding a center, it becomes the thing that makes it intelligible for all of us to decide, like, is this a church I can actually belong to in community? If you live, you know, out, you know, on far southeast Portland, for that matter, or outside of the city, and you're willing to come here and worship with us, you're willing to come be in community during the week, you're willing to come and serve with us as we try to tangibly serve the city of Portland, we say, welcome, come do that with us. Come breathe your energy into what's happening here. We need you. But if you just find yourself constantly frustrated, like, ah, it's so hard to get in there. It's so hard to make time. Ah, I can't really be involved in anyone's life. I'm just too far or whatever. We just say, that's really good data for you to have. And you should probably consider joining a church where you actually can be in proximate, intimate relationship with people because it's really important for following Jesus. So that's it. It's an invitation in. It's a center of gravity, not a wall that's meant to keep people out. So that's idea one. Idea two is that along with that is that the city pillar has defined our missional focus. So we are a redeemed people resisting and serving and proclaiming Jesus among our families, neighbors, coworkers, and so on. And we do it here. We do it somewhere. We prioritize loving the city of Portland in word and in deed. And so for our local ministry partners, like I just mentioned with First Image, we self-consciously say for local ministry initiatives, it's all going to happen within the context of Portland proper, Portland city limits. Just again, because this is where we want to proclaim the gospel. So our deeds, our loving deeds, our acts of compassion and mercy should be happening here as well, complementing the message that we're proclaiming by by the actions of our hands. So our missional focus, both in gospel presentation, just living amongst the people, and uh, of course, practically serving, is here in a place, Portland in particular. And then a third idea that's kind of always been around is that there's just a, a strategic element to this, and we've, we've talked about this a number of times, um, but there, there are so many people in cities. Portland's the biggest city in Oregon, so there's a strategic element to to holding a line that says, hey, we are a church for this city because there are so many people here. It's just like in the book of Jonah, as we as we studied a few weeks ago. The very conclusion to that book, God says, should I not pity or have compassion on Nineveh? Remember, evil, hor- you know, by any standard, a, a, a horrifically unjust city. But God says, should I not have compassion on them, that great city? They're great because they're, they're numerous. They're, God cares about them because they are big. They're full of people, full of people that he loves. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? He's even concerned about the animals. And we, sh- we should share that heart. So in, in, in an age where it's frankly, frankly much easier to sort of for, for churches to get to a certain size in Portland and then move out of the city where they can, you know, afford cheaper real estate or whatever, um, we say, no, it's, it's really important that there are gospel-proclaiming churches in the city, specifically, because there are far more people here. There's far more population density here than there is otherwise. That doesn't mean there don't need to be rural churches and suburban churches. God knows, because there's people there, too. There need to be churches there, too. But we think there is something uniquely strategic about holding a line for the city of Portland. And I would just say this, you're doing it. You're doing it, Door of Hope Northeast. Like, as we talked about repeatedly during the Jonah series, Portland in particular has, it has suffered a lot over the last five years in particular. And it is more than anything, maybe, uh, well, no, not more than anything. That, that's hyperbole. But what I just want to say is a notable thing is that it has, it has definitely lost uh, in terms of kind of national reputation, it's cool factor, you know? We, we mentioned this several weeks ago, but like a lot of us moved to the city 
um, if we didn't grow up here, because probably because Portland had this reputation of being like, oh man, this is such a cool, hip place, it's kind of a taste-making city, um, and so on and so forth. And man, has that reputation been hampered? And it's a test for how much we love our neighbors and love the people here and love this place, even when it's not serving us in the way that we might want it to. And it's exchanged um, that cool factor for, 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 you know, a degree of suffering and struggle and discomfort and tragedy and violence. Uh, and, and we lament all those things. And it's okay to lament those things. And it's okay to name those things. We don't have to be, like, running PR for the city. It's like, oh, everything's just great. Anyone who says that's just, you know, getting their news from the wrong places or whatever. Um, no. We can name it. But we can, uh, but I just say this, hey, you're here, you're here. And there's a lot of people that aren't. And that's okay, that's not, that's not right or wrong for people to have, have moved on to different churches or out of the state or out of the city or whatever. But I just say, it's, it's great. By your presence here, y- you are planting a flag for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the love of God and the love of neighbor here in Portland. Whether you understand yourself to be or not, I want to state it very clearly. If you're a disciple of Jesus and you're here, you are a missionary to this place, a servant to this place. And as we all know, it's not easy, but it is good. Isn't that true? Those, those aren't always the same thing. Something doesn't have to be easy to be good. And I think that, that committing to be a faithful representation of historic Christianity and the one true gospel of Jesus at this place at this time is deeply good, friends. So I say thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, And I say thank you sincerely to the other gospel-proclaiming churches in our city and Christians that attend those churches that are here, like seeking to love Jesus and love their neighbors with with authenticity and integrity. So that's what the city pillar does. But what I want to talk about a little bit more is, is what do we do while we're here? All those, things, all those things stated. What is our posture meant to be while we're here? That's what this morning is about. Um, so I want to pray one more time, and then we'll jump into that Jeremiah text that was read for us. Lord, help us. We need your spirit to move Lord, I need your words to be underneath mine. And Father, if there's anything I'm planning to say that is not of you, that is just my ideas or whatever, Lord, I just, I just pray that you'd protect us all from those. But may your heart towards this city just resonate and ring out this morning. And may we tune ourselves to it, to you. And Lord, I I do just genuinely thank you for all the people that are here in this room and all the people that are part of this community that are not in this room right now who have counted the cost of of living in kind of a hard place right now. And they've said that we're willing to count it and we're willing to be a gospel presence despite it. Thank you, Lord. That is a gift. We don't take it for granted. Amen. Amen. Well, Jeremiah 29, um, the, you know, the, the opening verses of the chapter kind of set the stage, but, but what we're told is that what follows is the words of a letter that one of God's prophets, a guy named Jeremiah, sent to the surviving elders of the exile and the priests and the prophets and the people. So, got to lay some, some foundation here for the background to this. So, so at this point in Israel's history, Jeremiah is an Old Testament book. The story here fo- follows towards the, the latter end of the Old Testament. Um, all kinds of trouble had befallen the nation. And at this point in their history, the, the kingdom of Israel had actually divided into two competing kingdoms. Um, the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. There, there, it was just this, all this intrigue and division and conflict, and they, they broke apart, and it's viewed as this like, tragic thing, like, oh my gosh, the, this, this nation who's supposed to represent God and his love and his unity has fragmented, and they've divided. Uh, maybe not quite as extreme to say it was a civil war, but that, that kind of a dynamic. And so uh, both of them had fallen into all kinds of idolatry and injustice and issues and problems. 
And God had said all the way back when he, when he gave them the law following the Exodus, when he rescued them from Egypt, he gave, them, he gave them the law and he said, listen, if you betray the terms of my covenant, namely, if you give yourself over to other gods, if you give yourself over to injustice, if you don't care for one another and for the people around you the way that I've commanded, trouble will come. And it's, it's, it's motivated by love. It's motivated by an eventual act of restoration, but, but you will be judged. You will be judged. You will be taken from your land. And sure enough, the ancient you know, empire of Assyria took the northern kingdom, and now the southern kingdom was captured by Babylon, the other gigantic superpower of the ancient world. So all the leaders, we're told, had been brought to Babylon, and God wants to send them a message now that they're in a foreign land. I want, I have something for you. Here's how you are supposed to live now that you are in enemy territory, forcefully taken from your land. That's what's going on here. And so the first, you know, if you're, if you're a conscientious student of the Bible, the first thing you should ask is like, oh, okay, well, is any of this applicable to us? Like, we're, we're not really in this situation. There's a historic, historical story, you know, about concrete events that happened. Why are you, pre- you going to shoehorn this into Portland? And I would just say, well, in this specific teaching from God to a very specific people in a very specific situation, most scholars agree we find a set of principles that embody the posture of the people of God everywhere and in every situation, even in every city they find themselves in. There's a very real sense in which even after uh, the people of Judah and Israel were returned from captivity to their land, that the exile wasn't really over. The, the, the former glory was never really reestablished. There was always something off about the city and the temple and its place in the world, and they were just always waiting for something more. Even when you get into the New Testament, it's very common for Jesus to talk about the life of people living their lives in terms of exi- exilic categories, being a stranger, being a sojourner, being someone whose like, fundamental home isn't quite here. Peter uses the word exile specifically to write to the churches that he wrote to. And so, yes, the idea of living in exile is still very, very much like a key category for how you and I should understand ourselves as Christians, even in Portland in 2023, though, though thankfully we're not, uh, we're not held here at, at, at gunpoint, most, I assume, most of us. Um, so, yes, I do think it's applicable, and that's the situation. Well, the bulk of the letter um, lays out three possibilities, three possibilities, and, I, and this, this kind of framework for understanding this was popularized by uh, Tim Keller. He, he's given a number of sermons on this passage that are, have been highly influential for me and a number of people, um, but I just want to read the passage again. Here's, here's how the letter begins. This is the first 10 verses of the letter. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. What's he going to say? What do you do? You've seen the temple destroyed. You've seen the city burned. You've seen your friends and family, some of them killed, and the many taken off by force in chains to a foreign nation. What do you do in that situation? Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Interesting, interesting. But it gets even more scandalous. Verse 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. That's Israel. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes 
and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. I'm going to use Keller's three possibilities that are, that are there. There are three possibilities. I mean, obviously, he's commanding them to do something, but those aren't, the, those aren't the only options for the captives, for the exiles. A first option is what we might call assimilation, just absolute conformity, conformity to blend in to the Babylonian surroundings. To assimilate would be to just become Babylonian in their most fundamental identity. Well, here we are. Let's just go along to get along. Let's worship the Babylonian gods. Let's adopt the Babylonian values. Let's do what the Babylonians want us to do. Let's abandon the ways in which God has called us to be distinct. In short, let's just keep doing the very things that have led us into exile. Tim Keller rightly pointed out that what likely would motivate assimilation is the idea of self-preservation. You know, when you're in a hostile environment and there's people saying, like, like they have literally enacted violence upon you to get you here and they want you to just fall in, the, the easiest thing to do is just say, yeah, I'm fine, I'm cool. I'll just, yes, 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 whatever you're for, I'm for, I'm just going to go for it. It's a self-preservation that leads to that. Um, what might this look like in our context? What might this look like in Portland in 2023? Again, same thing. We're not in Babylon, but just going along to get along. The idea of just slowly making concessions around what you believe and how you live to just be more comfortable. Slowly, slowly disassociating from Jesus, his kingdom, the places where his values butt up against the values of Portland. It's slowly losing your critical lens, your ability to say like, this thing is actually, it's not right. It's not just, it's not in line with the character and and vision of God for human flourishing. Just slowly saying, oh yeah, everything's just kind of fine and cool. And the tragedy is that you, you start making little, I mean, no one just Almost no one just flips on these things overnight, but, but the common way it happens is just one day after small compromise, after small compromise, after small compromise, after small compromise, one day you do wake up and find that you curse the name of Jesus rather than love the name of Jesus. And there's a million little decisions that, that get you t- from, from point A to point B, but it happens. We, we've all, probably all seen friends or family members do that. It slowly starts with just slowly eroding Jesus' teachings and what he's calling us to little by little. But yeah, I still love Jesus. Of course I do. Until one day it's like, shut up about Jesus. Jesus is repressive. Jesus is evil. Jesus is backwards. Jesus doesn't love you. Jesus doesn't care about you. Jesus probably didn't even exist. That's assimilation. There's another option, and that's isolation. Isolation. Or what, I might t- <laughs> what you might term the holy huddle. The false prophets, so notice Jeremiah is saying, don't listen to these prophets that are among you. He's not saying don't listen to genuine prophets of God. He's saying that the, these people posing as prophets in your midst, they are not speaking on my behalf. And that's a really big deal, to put words in the mouth of God. But what they appeared to be prophesying about, they, they were suggesting that, that you, we read this as you read on in Jeremiah, what these pr- false prophets were saying was that this exile was going to be really short, actually. They were saying that they are going to be restored back to Jerusalem very, very soon. You're just going to be here for a few months, maybe a couple of years, but we are going to be right back. Babylon's going to get judged. Guys, you just hang on for a little bit. We'll be back in, the, in our comfortable land soon. And, and the implication of that was that there was no reason to settle in for the long haul. Their prophecies would have encouraged an isolationist mindset. This is, hey, we're not going to be here for long. You know, we're, we're going back to where we, you know, where we belong. We don't really have to, like, make a home here. We don't really have to get to know these people. We don't really have to do the things that, like, make life life. The idea was that they could embrace a distance from, from what, in, in the mildest form, Um, wants to see Babylon given over to whatever happens to it, and in its most extreme form, actively hates and works against the people of Babylon. It's just kind of like, forget this place. We're going to be out of here soon. At best, what happens happens. At worst, I hate these people. I hate this place. 
the sooner we can shake the dust off our feet, the better. And Keller observed that this, this is often motivated by group preservation. Group preservation. We want to keep our group, you know, distinct. We want to keep our group safe. We want to, and that's a good thing for your people. You want your people to be safe or whatever. But that's so, that is dangerous territory, friends. In group, out group stuff. We've all seen it. It's very hard for that not to curdle into a hatred of others, isn't it? And that's very often what happens. So the holy huddle, let's just do our thing, focus on us, stay safe, and get out of here as soon as we can. What might that look like in Portland? Same thing. A holy huddle of Christian isolationism. Refusing to really know and care for your neighbors. Viewing every interaction with someone who doesn't think like you or believe like you or act like you, have the same views on things, vote like you, whatever it may be. Viewing every interaction as a threat. Well, that's not safe. It's not safe for me to be around this person. Refusing to care about these people slowly. Here's, what, here's how this happens. It slowly starts as distance that turns into walls that then turns into hatred for everyone that's unlike you or everyone that's unlike us. Just name it, us, Christians, people who follow Jesus. Distance to walls to hatred. It's a common story. It's a really common story. So, assimilation, do what the Babylonians do. Isolation, hate these people, don't want anything to do with them. Let's keep our distance. And then there's what Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah, actually calls them to. Which a, word, a word I like for this is cultivation. Cultivation. It's maintaining distinction, but it's a loving service. Service motivated by love towards the other. This is the heart of what God's calling them to. And look how mundane it is. Look how mundane it is. What does he say? What does it look like? Build houses. Live in them. Just live. Live your life. Make gardens. Eat of those gardens. Feed yourself. Feed your children. Feed your neighbors. Marry and have children. And help your children marry and have children. Multiply. Don't see your population decrease, but increase. Embrace the gift of family and life. And then he goes even further. He says, seek its good. Seek its welfare. And that is just a general statement to say like, whatever is good for the city, genuinely good. Good as God defines it. Do that for the city. Do that for the city. Pray for it, he says. Pray for its benefit. Pray for its blessing. Seek God. Of course, that's a good in and of itself, but seek God for the good of the city. Be transformed by God so that you will be a presence of transformation in and for the city. This is the gospel way. This is the way Jesus and the New Testament writers, the the apostles, the disciples spoke about this. There's all kinds of metaphors they use to describe our relationship to our earthly cities. We already talked about exiles. That's one. We are exiles. This is not like our final home in a, in a certain sense. But also to be lovers of the city. Servants. Or I love, I love the language Paul uses. I think it's in 1 Corinthians. Ambassadors. An ambassador wholly hangs on to his identity or her identity as one who has a fundamental allegiance to their home country, right? But they come as a loving, you know, peaceful, bridge-building presence into the other culture for its good, for both, both nations' good. That's us. I'd say again, loving a city, being an ambassador toward a city, being a servant of a city is not, does not require you to overlook its problems. It's just helping rather than running away. It's not denying. It's just choosing to be a presence of love and peace and light and salt rather than giving it over to its own destruction. 
What God is saying here through Jeremiah is that loving the broken cities of our world, and Portland is one of them, really all of them are, are, are broken in their own way, it requires a distinction from them in belief and practice. If we're not distinct, we have nothing to offer. There's nothing to offer. There's no difference. It's just like, yeah, let's just keep doing, keep doing what got us here. It's distinction. But it's, dis- it's from that distinction that we can be a presence of the peace of God, the shalom of God, the goodness of God in them. So our desire must be to see the Jesus who was lifted up on the cross, now lifted up by us in our words and deeds, that he might draw many to himself here in Portland. We must want to see the gospel save our neighbors here. We must want to be the kind of community that's a place of hospitality and love and teaching and service to any who enter it. We must want to be the kinds of individuals who radiate the fruit of the Spirit wherever we go. And we must want to see the kingdom of God come and the will of God done as we pray every week here in Portland as it is in heaven. So what might this look like, this cultivational posture look like here in Portland? Same thing. Make friends. Be a good neighbor. Work with integrity at your job, whether it's in the home or outside the home. Live a life of generosity. Live a life of sexual integrity. Live a life of family love. Support Our local artists make beautiful things to put out into the world. Pray for the city. Pray for your friends. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your enemies. Pray for the most vulnerable in our midst. Pray for the city's leaders. It's harder to do that than just tweet negative things about them. Commit yourself all over again to knowing Jesus and following him in community. Do your part to make your life, your home, and our church a beautiful picture of the countercultural good news of the gospel of Jesus. And amidst all of this, become an invitational gospel-sharing presence. Tell the good news that Jesus is king, that he loves everyone, and that he died to save them and to bring them a life more beautiful than they can imagine. But that they do need saving just as I do and just as you do. That's what it means, I think, to cultivate here and everywhere. Well, in each message of this series, we've talked about um, kind of developing a set of, of practices or disciplines in our day-to-day lives to help us kind of live into these ideas a little bit more deeply. Um, and I've, I've said it again, and we'll, next week I'm going to share some actual like, resources to help us sit down and figure out how to implement these things into our lives. And we're going to discuss these in the community group, try to put some track to this. But just to recap again, I, I think it's just good to revisit these ideas. Three weeks ago, we talked about two daily practices for going deeper through the cross. And this is all Christianity 101, but if you've got a better idea, let me know. Those two were a daily commitment to time in the scriptures and a daily commitment to prayer. Two weeks ago, we talked about two weekly disciplines. Those are daily, now weekly disciplines for going deeper into community. Weekly gathering with the whole church body, prioritize this time. And weekly gathering in a community group. And if not a community group, let's talk about another space where you can weekly commit to being with the people of God for the purpose of growing around him together. And then last week, we talked about two monthly practices of space-making and load-sharing that help us keep our value around simplicity. And those were giving financially and serving, doing those once a month. So each of these, for us who worship and gather and live our lives to some degree in the midst of our city, is a means of loving our city. I I don't want you to lose that connection. Becoming a cross-formed individual who radiates the grace and truth, love, and justice of God. Becoming a community-forming individual who contributes to these spaces where people can come and encounter the gospel and the love of God in tangible, visible ways. Becoming a simplicity-formed individual who makes a habit of contributing to the church community's goals through giving and serving here and out in the city with our ministry partners. All of these are ways of actually, like, Shining gospel light in this city. Don't lose that connection. 
And as a quick side note, I, I do just want to mention that so many people want to make a difference in our city. So many of you do. That was another one of the just cries of the heart over these last couple of months that I heard. But I know that each of us can so easily be paralyzed by like the buffet of options that's out there. Like, man, I care about like racial justice, but I also care about the poor and the vulnerable in this community. I also p- care about um, immigrants and refugees, you know, all these different things. You're just like, whoa. And you know, if you spend too much time on social media, you get this sense of like, man, everyone who's like actually thoughtful is involved in like 50 organizations and doing all this stuff. And I just, spoiler alert, they're not. They tweet about it a lot. Probably. More realistically, each of us has the time and the margin to pick a one or two things that you're like, man, my heart just beats for this and I'm going to commit myself to it. And that's actually where the deep, good difference gets made. Not by social media posturing. In some ways, that probably just does more harm than good. So all of us don't, you know, our, our, our buffet of choices and obligations can paralyze us, but start by just picking one thing that you care about and say, I'm going to actually give some real time and some real energy and maybe some money to this in a way that's costly and see what happens. That's way better than what you post on Facebook. So anyway, so let's do one more, one more discipline. All of these are related to the city, but let's do one more that's, again, almost insultingly simple. This week, I would maybe call us all into one more monthly practice to help us move into the city. And it's a really simple one, again. I would just call it invitation. What would it mean to state a goal that once a month, just once a month, once a month, you make an invitation of one of these three sorts, an invitation to Jesus. This is the boldest one. Say, once a month, I'm going to share the gospel of Jesus with someone in my life. The good news of his life, his death, his resurrection, the hope that he offers, the grace and infinite forgiveness and mercy that he has. It's one. Maybe you're a little less bold than that. Maybe you're a little less bold than that. Um, I often am. Make an invitation just into your community whether that's just your, your kind of Christian friend group or whatever, but a place to say, hey, why don't you come spend time with us as we are just who we are, people who love and serve Jesus, but also, you know, do normal things that people do. We just live our lives. And then just be proactively inviting people to just come get a sense of the flavor of what life is like amongst the people of God. And then another one is, this is related to that, of course, but just an invitation to church. Not to pad the numbers here on a Sunday morning, but just to say, this is a place we hope that will be, I love the way Josh White would always put it, we want this to be the most comfortable place in the world to hear the most uncomfortable message in the world. I love that. But we try really hard to make this a warm and inviting space that's easy to just come in. If you don't know what you believe about Jesus, it is, you are welcome here as long as you want to come listen to me yammer, you know, like, that's totally fine. As long as you want to come sing with us, as long as you want to come, you know, everyone is welcome here. But we are calling all of us somewhere, and that is to obedience to the risen Jesus, to the historic Jesus. But we just say, you know, inviting someone to church, we want it to be a comfortable thing for them to come and say, yeah, it is totally fine to be here and not know what I think about all this stuff. Or even to say, I disagree with that guy or that girl. We still want you here. Please come, continue, if you want to, to journey as we are following Jesus. And we try every week to make sure that the gospel is proclaimed in some form. So invite someone to Jesus, invite them into your community, or just invite them into church. What would happen if every one of us just said, once a month, I'm just going to risk. I'm just going to risk and make an invitation in one of these ways to someone, to someone. I think the Lord could do a lot with that. Well, to conclude, to conclude, the last, I'm going to reread the last few verses of this, that we don't miss it. He's told them what to do, but then he says, 
Thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon. So he's saying, in 70 years, the, the, the exile will be over. I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promises. I will bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray for me, to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So is this promise for us? Uh, Once again, it's a very specific promise to a very specific people. In 70 years, you will be restored back to Israel, but all of our grandmas who have this verse, like crocheted up in their kitchen, they're right. They're right. This is a very popular verse because it does speak to some of the deepest truths imaginable. God does have a good plan for us. It is now for us and to us through Jesus. He does have plans to give us a future and a hope and to prosper us. He does have plans for welfare, the deep for us, the deepest we could possibly imagine. That's union with him through Christ, forgiveness of our sins, his genuine righteousness, and and a, a grafting into his eternal family that will never be lost and broken. And the glories of not just a meaningful, purpose-driven life in the here and now, but a future in the glorious new heavens and new earth where he wipes every tear from every eye, removes every trace of sin and evil and injustice, and gives us a perfect beginning to the beautiful new story that we can only dream and imagine how glorious it's going to be. So, to conclude all this, I would just say trust the promises of God. His, prom- his purposes are good. His plans are good. And seek him. May we seek him. May we not be content with where we are now or even 20 years from now, but may we always be yearning for more of him. There is always more to discover through the cross, with community, simply, and in and for our city. He's telling us he wants to be found, but he will only be found in the deepest ways if we leave nothing on the table, if we seek him with all of our hearts. So so may whatever we experience this year not be for lack of pursuit, lack of passion, lack of calling and praying and seeking with all of our hearts, door of hope. Amen? Let's pray.